Okay, uh, good afternoon folks and welcome to today's webinar presented by the Biochemical Society and Portland Press, uh, which is part of the Biochemistry Focus webinar series. Uh, topics in this series include different research areas in the molecular biosciences, as well as practical sessions to support career development. Each webinar will give you the opportunity to ask questions via text, uh, and we also welcome suggestions for future topics and speakers to feature in the webinar series. Uh, so please see the website for more details. My name is David Hunt. I'm part of the science and technology team at the Good Food Institute Europe, and I will be your moderator for today's webinar. Uh, the title of our webinar today is Alternative Protein Careers for Biochemists, and we will hear from Saren Kell and Petra Hanga, who will both shed light on the alternative protein ecosystem and discuss opportunities for scientists with biochemistry or closely affiliated backgrounds to engage in alternative protein research. Uh, before I hand over to our first speaker, just a little bit of housekeeping, I'd like to mention the questions will be asked at the end of the webinar, but please do send in your questions during the talks. Um, if you have a question, please type it in the question box as shown on the screen here, and please state who your question is for, uh, and then we will try to get to as many of those as we can at the end. Uh, so today our first invited speaker is Saren Kell from the Good Food Institute Europe. Saren's background is originally in biochemistry with a focus on cellular senescence and the fundamental processes underlying human aging. Uh, over the past few years, she has been involved in the cultivated meat space, uh, first focusing on cell culture media and then co-founding Cellular Agriculture UK, um, but also has been involved in the external innovation uh, more generally. Now with the Good Food Institute Europe, Saren leads our science and technology team uh, to build a strong, open access, sustainable protein research and training ecosystem across Europe. And today, Saren is going to give us an overview of how she entered the field, as well as exploring some exciting opportunities for others to engage in alternative protein research. So we can see you, Saren. We can see your slides. I will hand it over to you. Perfect. Thank you so much, Dave. Um, so, yeah, as you said, I'm going to briefly introduce GFI, talk a little bit about the, the need for alternative proteins, the underlying science and technology, and then really focus um, on specific career opportunities in the space obviously in the context of those who have a biochemistry background and I could talk a little bit about myself um, and how I came to turn to proteins with a biochemistry background. Um, okay, so the Good Food Institute is an international non-profit organization working to build a more sustainable, secure and just food system by transforming um, the way in which we produce meat, eggs and dairy. The way in which we do that is through three programmatic areas, so science and technology, so this is working to build a strong open access research ecosystem around alternative proteins, corporate engagement, so working with the commercial sector to um, support them as they move into the space and de-risk and help scale those technologies, and then finally through policy, advoc advocating for fair, transparent um, kind of path to market for alternative proteins and enabling policy environment and public research funding for alternative proteins. So the, the why. Um, essentially, if you look at industrial animal agriculture, it is, if not the major, one of the major drivers of many of the world's most pressing problems. So that includes environmental devastation, and that's not just climate change and greenhouse gas emissions, but also other things like land use, water use, nutrient runoff, um, things like that, global food insecurity, the best way of seeing this is that the vast majority of our global farmland goes to producing um, animal protein or feed to produce animal protein, and yet it actually produces a very small fraction of the total number of calories that we eat. So it's actually just a very, very inefficient way to feed people. Um, if we look at things like public health, the vast majority of zoonotic diseases of, of pandemics are zoonotic, so they are derived from animals, and you basically couldn't design a more effective incubator for this than an industrial animal farm. And then, of course, there's the question of, of animal suffering for those um, involved in the process. Despite that, if we look at global meat production trends over the coming decades, it's actually just projected to continue to go up and up. And it seems like meat production and meat consumption tracks in a linear way with global economic development. So if we look at countries, for example, like India and China and Nigeria and Brazil, this is where we're going to see future meat demand almost doubling by the year 2050. And the reason why is that, you know, we know that there are these various externalities um, associated with, with large scale intensive meat production. 
it's not actually changing the fact that, that this demand is going to continue to increase. Why is that? And at the Good Food Institute, we see this as really coming down to what the actual major drivers of consumer decision making are. And when people sit down and decide what they're going to eat, they're just not in most cases primarily thinking about things like the environmental cost of what they're eating. For the vast majority of people, the foundational drivers for what they choose to eat are taste and price and convenience. And when I say the vast majority of people, these are not the existing vegetarians and vegans who are already choosing to reduce or eliminate meat from their diet and other animal products. It's the omnivores and the flexitarians, which is where if you care about actual impact, this is the target market um, where meat, meat consumption needs to be reduced. And for these people, it's taste and price and convenience are the core drivers. And what they're looking for are alternative protein products, which are as delicious and affordable and accessible as they are generally used to, but just produced in a far more sustainable way. Okay, so if we jump into the science and technology, um, at the Good Food Institute, we break alternative proteins down into these three verticals. So plant-based, fermentation and cultivated. Plant-based is probably the most familiar vertical. Um, this is where the vast majority of products that we see on the market right now fall into this category. So this is where we are taking plants, um, breaking them down into their constituent components, and then from that engineering products, which really do have that same kind of look and cook and taste as, as conventional meat. Um, I'm going to discuss fermentation and then I'll do for, I'll, I'll cultivate it and I'll do fermentation afterwards. So cultivated, we're going to hear much more about that um, from Petra in the next talk, but essentially cultivated meat is real animal tissue, but produced without an animal. So essentially you are borrowing techniques from things like tissue culture or regenerative medicine to grow the relevant cell types for meat. So things like connective tissue and muscle tissue and fat tissue. Um, and doing so in a way that is in a bioreactor. So you are not needing to grow an animal, extract a very small fraction of their total biomass and then consume that. And then finally, fermentation is probably the broadest category insofar as it, it refers to a range of different technologies and approaches to produce either alternative proteins directly or to produce specific ingredients that makes it much easier to innovate with these other two verticals. Um, and Essentially, this is just using microorganisms in, in weird and wonderful ways. So it, it could be things like biomass fermentation. So, um, for example, the company corn, we are consuming a mycoprotein, a mycelium. The, the, the microorganism itself is the final product. But then there are also things like precision fermentation, which analogizes with recombinant protein production, where you are using microbial hosts to produce specific ingredients. So specific proteins, specific fats, um, whey proteins, caseins, for example, which allow you to produce actual um, ingredients that you would otherwise find um, in an animal. Looking at the science and technology, we can basically say that over the last decade or so, which is when the alternative protein sector really started to kick off, we have come a very, very long way in terms of what has been achieved and how much the science has actually driven forward. And we've really actually seen that in reflected in how well the current products do replicate um, the taste and the texture of, of the animal products that they're trying to displace. That being said, for an industry where much of the research field didn't exist prior to a decade ago, it's not surprising that there is a huge amount of untapped, unexplored, um, low-hanging fruit from a research perspective that is, is still to be picked. Um, we can go into that in a little bit more detail. So starting with plant-based meat, um, if we look at how plant-based meat is actually made, you take crops, you are then extracting various different macronutrients from them. So the proteins, removing the oil, the carbohydrates, things like that. You are then processing these ingredients and functionalizing them. And then finally texturizing them, which is a way to kind of persuade those plant proteins, which are generally globular, to behave like animal proteins, which are generally fibrillar, so that you have finally a texturized meat tissue-like product um, to produce uh, steaks, burgers, sausages, etc. Um, if we dive briefly into fermentation, um, again, I described before, this is, is in many ways the kind of 
the category that composes the most buckets of different kinds of technology, but using microorganisms to process ingredients and produce large volumes of biological materials is very much not a new thing. Um, it is a mature technology, it's proven at scale um, in various sectors, in the food sector, but also in other sectors such as pharmaceuticals. Um, it's happening in very high volumes. Um, it can be produced in low cost. It's, as mentioned, kind of familiar to the food industry, not just to produce things um, like specific ingredients and, and kind of nutraceuticals, but also the use of traditional fermentation that we've been doing for literally thousands of years. Um, rapid R&D cycles, which is obviously a huge advantage, and rapid production as well. And then finally, if we look at cultivated meat, um, as described, this is kind of giving a, a kind of brief overview of what that process looks like, but you're essentially taking those cells from a relevant species, growing them up in a bioreactor, providing an appropriate cell culture media, which is giving those cells everything they need to do to either proliferate or differentiate into the relevant cell types for um, actual meat. Um, and as I say, it could be a change in those media conditions, which is this phase two, which will actually trigger that differentiation into different cell types. Um, so if we look at kind of my point before was that there's a lot of white space here. There's a lot of things that really can be done. Um, that is from the scientific perspective, but it really is from multiple perspectives where a scientific background would be a useful thing here. So. Um, I can talk a little bit about myself and how I came into the space. So um, I originally studied biochemistry in Oxford. And as Dave mentioned, when I kind of was at the bench, I was focusing on, on cellular senescence and trying to understand that um, and specifically trying to find biomarkers for senescent cells. Um, after that, I went and worked at a startup called InPart which is essentially, um, they would describe themselves as Tinder for tech. It is essentially an organization that is trying to provide a matchmaking function between university research and industry through helping things like technology um, showcase the research that they're doing to industry partners. Um, and I was focusing on working with industry partners, kind of understanding what their needs were and what, what it looked like for them to be doing open innovation and going and finding the right people in universities um, for them to be working with. In parallel with this, um, I had essentially heard about cultivated meat and kind of, I mean, I guess I just thought it was the coolest thing ever, um, to, to put it in kind of quite blunt terms. Um, and so in parallel with working at Impart, where I was getting, a, I guess, a decent sense of what it looks like for science to leave the bench and, and go into industry and, and what the different pathways to market are, I became really interested in cultivated meat. And so myself and a few others founded an organisation called Cellular Agriculture UK, which was essentially trying to build the cellular agriculture ecosystem. Um, for example, they're going to give talks at universities, trying to bring entrepreneurs into the space and trying to introduce the scientific challenges to scientists who could actually um, go on to address those challenges. And then finally, about two and a half years ago, I, I joined the Good Food Institute um, in Europe um, to oversee our, our SciTech work. So we've looked at kind of the three verticals of alternative protein production. And I've kind of mentioned that as it stands, there's a lot of progress has been made, but there's actually just a huge amount of white space and, and a real opportunity for scientists moving into the space to work on things, which are, I guess one way of seeing it is it's just a very uncrowded research space relative to other places. And so there's a real chance to make a lot of progress um, in a relatively short amount of time. So a summary on this slide um, essentially provides some of the major research priorities for those three verticals. So for example, breeding crops which have um, high yields and those proteins have better functionality for plant-based meat applications. I haven't spoken about fat, but essentially fat is a large part of why meat tastes good. Um, and it's quite hard to find equivalents in the plant kingdom which taste and, and function and cook in a similar way to animal fats there's some really interesting research challenges there around how it's layered in the tissue and how it's encapsulated things like that cultivated meat um we'll probably hear more from petra around the work that she's been doing on cultivated meat but really it comes down to trying to reduce costs and trying to build a scalable and efficient process um that 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 can be done um uh, cheaply enough such that it can compete with conventional meat. 
Um, and then finally, fermentation. Um, it depends on whether you're talking about biomass fermentation or precision fermentation, but there's a lot of interesting work that can be done looking into different microbial strains that make sense for alternative proteins or optimizing some of the downstream processing, um, increasing the yields of different proteins that you're expressing in, in the microorganisms, things like that. Um, I've just outlined a few scientific challenges. Um, those can obviously be carried out in academia. They can also be carried out in industry. I do want to emphasize that those are not the only options for those with a scientific background. Um, obviously, I myself am working on a nonprofit organization trying to support the research ecosystem with my work. Um, but this is just to say that there are many different ways and in many different sectors that one can support the alternative proteins transition with a scientific background. Um, for those who want to focus on addressing those scientific challenges, we have a list on our website, but I just wanted to kind of showcase here some of the major disciplines that are most relevant for alternative proteins. Um, some of them are more relevant for one vertical than the other, but biochemistry and molecular biology in general is something which can just be incredibly helpful un for understanding and addressing a lot of those scientific challenges for plant-based cultivated and fermentation. Um, okay, the final thing I wanted to do, I think I only have a few minutes left, was just briefly overview some of the main resources that we at the Good Food Institute have developed to try and support scientists um, and those with a scientific background wanting to move into the space. Um, so firstly, we have what is called our Alternative Protein Solutions Database. This is essentially a wish list of some of the most important research priorities that need to be addressed for alternative proteins. We have a company database, so that could be if you're looking to work in the space, if you're looking to find a collaborative partner for a proposal, for example, that you might be looking to submit. Um, and then likewise, if you're looking for non-commercial partners, but other academic um, potential collaborators, I'd really recommend both checking out and potentially adding yourself to our alternative proteins researcher directory. We also have a GF for the ideas community and one of the, I think, one of the most helpful things that comes out of this for scientists is the fact that we have recurring webinars where we bring in speakers who are working on alternative protein science um, and they can showcase what they're doing and, and answer helpful questions about that um, and just to help kind of help scientists across different um, jurisdictions and across different fields who are actually trying to solve similar challenges talk to one another. GFI ourselves, we do also fund science ourselves. So every year we run an annual research grants program and generally those projects go towards trying to address some of those most kind of um, catalytic research areas as outlined in our Alternative Protein Solutions Database. Um, to date, that's been running for a few years now. To date, um, we've now funded uh, over 100 research projects, and of that, that's included a total of over 16 million euros and across multiple, multiple countries around the world. And that doesn't include um, those funded this year. So definitely, if this is a space that you're interested in and you want to dive more into the science and think that it might otherwise be hard for you to get a grant in this, for example, if you don't have any proof of concept work on alternative proteins, our grant program is really trying to help that happen, help um, newcomers move into the space, so definitely do check that out. Um, we do also keep track of uh, external funding opportunities, um, so you can go to our research funding database at any point in time, which curates alternative protein relevant live government grant availabilities, and we also track those which have happened previously at what level in different countries um, in our research grants tracker. So that can be interesting just to take a look at which countries are really leaning into this and where lots of the science is happening. Um, if you are a student or you teach students, we do also develop a bunch of different resources to support with that. So if you're looking to develop a course in alternative proteins or alternative protein teaching library, essentially houses a bunch of open access materials that you can use as part of developing that course. We host a database of existing global courses so you can see who is running those courses um, and get in contact with them either as an educator or if you're a student and you want to go and study um, it, something that's something around the science or turn to proteins that's a great place to look and also ourselves at gfi we have developed an online free course which gives you an overview of the science of alternative proteins um i think this is my penultimate slide but just to say 
there are other things we do for those who are looking to move into the space independent of whether they want to stay in academia so we do have a guide for students and newcomers and if you're more on the entrepreneurial side we do also have a startup manual that really helps you move into the alternative protein space and finally outside of gfi there are also some other organizations which have some helpful resources for those who want to work um, on industrial animal agriculture to proteins type roles and with that i think i really am actually done um the last thing i'll say is if you've not been tracking all of the links i've been mentioning which would not be surprising um you can just find all of these at gfi.org or gfieurope.org forward slash science or you can reach out to myself or any of my colleagues and i think with that i will finish and pass back to dave okay thank you so much Sarah. super interesting and we will Come back to you again in about 20 minutes time for some discussion uh just to say if anybody does have questions for saren um, please do put them in the question box um stating who your question is for and we will come back to them at the end and try to address um as many of them as we possibly can so uh, moving on our next invited speaker is petra hanga from university college london uh petra graduated with a bachelor of engineering and briefly worked as a chemical engineer in romania before moving to the uk to start her PhD at Loughborough University in 2009. Since then, Petra has been a lecturer in biochemical engineering at Aston University and is now a lecturer in biochemical engineering and cellular agriculture at UCL. Today, Petra will explore the different aspects and considerations needed for manufacturing cultivated meat products. And we'll also discuss the opportunities for innovation, both from an academic and an entrepreneurial perspective. So Petra, we can see you, we can see your slides. Uh, please take oh, it away. Perfect. Good. Um, thank you so much, David. Um, hello, everyone. I'm absolutely delighted to um, be here and um, to share a little bit of my experience um, of how I um, started working in the space um, and um, with well, with both of my hats on as an academic and also an um, entrepreneur. Um, so, um, where am I? Right now, um, I, um, I wear two hats, so I'm an academic at uh, UCL, as Dave mentioned, um, and I've, in my role at UCL, um, I've established and um, I'm also leading the Cell Agriculture Research Group um, that is focused on bringing UCL researchers with an interest in the alternative protein space, bringing them together um, and have a UCL-wide platform. Um, but I'm also a co-founder and the chief scientific officer for a cultivated meat startup, um, Quest Meat, um, that is based in Birmingham. And um, it was funded um, shortly before I joined uh, UCL. Um, so how did I get here? Um, I am a biochemical engineer by training. Um, after I graduated in Romania, where I'm originally from, um, I worked in Romania as a laboratory specialist for about a year and a half. Um, however, I, I realized that that job wasn't really offering me what um, I was very interested in, and that was opportunities to um, harness some of, uh, some of that interest in science um, and develop um, research skills. Um, so um, I, I reconsidered my opportunities and um, where I was at the time, and I actually decided that a PhD would give me um, uh, those skills and, and um, that drive for um, science. So I, um, I found a doctoral training center in regenerative medicine that was currently based uh, at that time based at Loughborough University and I applied for it and I was admitted. So that meant um, that I had to move from Romania to the UK. Um, after I graduated my PhD, um, then I stayed in Loughborough um, and did a postdoctorate. Um, and that was when um, I developed my skills um further my technical skills further and in the next slides i'll um, go through some of those technical skills um, that i developed um, throughout my journey and then at the end of my um, postdoctorate i was actually lucky enough to be able to um, uh, secure an academic position as a lecturer at Aston university um, and then from there onwards everything kind of fell into place 
Um, so in, in August 2021, um, I um, co-funded um, a my own startup in the cultivated meat space, and then shortly after I joined UCL. Um, and you know, realistically, my journey in the alternative protein space started um, during my lectureship at Austin um, University, um, and um, it, it pretty much started because I realized how translatable my skills were um, to this uh, new concept of uh, cultivated meat. Um, that um, I was I was starting to hear more about um, at the time in 2019. So um, I became aware of this opportunity that the Good Food Institute was offering in terms of their um, funding program, um, and I applied. And um, that's that's pretty much how my journey in the alternative protein space started um, with the GFI uh, funding on a project that was using my. Um, technical skills and my expertise at the time. Um, and to be honest, since then, um, I've only been doing research in the alternative protein space, even though on, you know, on my UCL profile still says that I'm, um, I am doing some work in the healthcare space as well, but realistically not quite. Um, okay, so I'm, I'm gonna go through some of the, uh, through uh, my projects um, and some of my technical skills that I've developed during my PhD and my postdoctorate to give you a bit of an idea of how I progressed um, in terms of building on those uh, necessary technical skills. So um, during my PhD um, as part of the doctoral training center in regenerative medicine, um, I was trying to address one of the challenges at the time, and that was um, uh, focusing on bioprocessing tools um, and specifically on microcarriers, which are used to grow cells in bioreactors. Um, and my project identified uh, the shortcomings of the um, uh, commercially available microcarriers at the time, which um, was their uh, lack of fit for purpose for those applications, but also the fact that in order to harvest those cells, um, uh, very harsh enzymatic treatments were required. So during my PhD, I was trying to marry the um, the positives of microcarriers in terms of their ability to grow cells um, and bypass surface limitations of uh, lab scale. Um, uh, culture vessels with um, novel uh, polymers um, and particularly a stimuli responsive polymer, poly polyanisopropyl um, which has some fantastic characteristics to it in the sense that it changes its um, conformation and structure in response to temperature. And it has a transition temperature of 32 degrees, which is close to the physiological 37 degrees that we grow cells at. So that made it very, very useful. Um, and the idea was that at 37, when you would um, have your cells um, cultured in incubators, the cells would be able to attach to these particles. Um, but then when you would want um, to harvest the cells, um, you would just need to lower the temperature below this transition temperature. Um, and with that change, the conformation of the polymer would change and that would drive the detachment of the cells without having to use those harsh enzymatic treatments. Um, so I was trying to marry this approach with membrane emulsification to make high throughput uh, particles um, to be used as these uh, microcarriers. And these are some images showing cells that were cultured on the particles on these stimuli responsive microcarriers that are made up. Um, and you can see how these particles were almost confluent. So what you can see as, as brownish, those are cells that were attached. And then this is a fluorescent imaging, uh, fluorescent image where the cells are shown in green. And then by exposing these particles to room temperature, you can see how the cells have detached as either single cells or small clumps. Um, and very importantly, the viability of the cells was maintained above 90%. Um, so in terms of the technical skills that I developed, um, well, I, I did a lot of um, cell culture, so I've learned a lot. Uh, I have learned cell culture of uh, different cell types, different cell lines, mammalian, but also human, um, and including stem cells. 
I've worked with biomaterials, um, so the stimuli responsive polymer, but then also um, explored um, different hydrogels that could potentially use for this application. Um, and then of course, membrane emulsification for making the particles. Then um, during my postdoctorate, um, also at Loughborough University, I've developed these skills even further. So this time I was still looking at microcarriers, but it was a completely novel approach, um, trying to utilize two-phase liquid-liquid um, systems to make temporary liquid microcarriers. Um, so in this project, um, the idea was the same, that we would want microcarriers that would be more fit for purpose and that would bypass the um, necessity of using enzymatic treatment to harvest the cells. Um, but it would use these two-phase liquid-liquid system uh, made up of two liquids that are immiscible. So think uh, water in oil or oil in water. These two would never mix, but you are able to disperse one into the other to form droplets. And actually those droplets were what we were using as microcarriers. And then when you want to harvest the cells, uh, you would just have to induce a step of separation um, for those two, uh, two phases, and that would lead to the collection of or accumulation of the cells at the interface from where they could be collected. So for this project, um, I started working with human mesenchymal stem cells more um, and exploring different donors, looking at growing these cells on the particles. And again, you can see some images here, including fluorescent images where live cells were green. Um, and also trying to do this in different bioreactor systems. So um, I started gaining more experience in the stem cell culture and characterization area, but also in working with different bioreactors um, to grow the cells. Um, and then bottom line was when I became an academic, I took over those skills and I started um, uh, developing more my bioprocessing skills and that meant uh, working with a variety of bioreactor platforms, different scales, but also the same system, microcarriers in stir tank bioreactors. Um, so when uh, in, in about, in yeah, I think it was around 2018 when um, I became aware of uh, cultivated meat, um, and I actually, the more I was reading about this concept, the more interested I became because of obvious benefits that Soren did a great job in, in explaining earlier. Um, but one thing that I really realized was the need for skills like the ones that I had in terms of translating the culture um, systems, the, the cultures from lab scale to industrial systems. And um, these skills uh, in, in the bioprocessing area. So I applied for GFI funding, and um, that is how my alternative proteins um, uh, journey um, started with the GFI um, funding for that project. Um, so kind of honing into cultivated meat, because this is where I've done most of the work so far. Um, and uh, Seren mentioned this a little bit, um, very briefly explained what cultivated meat is, but what I want to do now is, is go through um, uh, in a bit more detail through what are the elements that go into manufacturing cultivated meat. And I've tried to identify what would be the opportunities for research, but then also um, career opportunities um, for you. So, um, for those of you that are not very familiar with the cultivated meat concept, um, you, you might have come across it under different names, but essentially it means the same thing. Um, it is real, genuine uh, meat um, that has the same cell structure, the same composition, uh, the same taste, nutritional profile, etc., but it is made in a different way. Um, by using biotechnology um, in a controlled environment, so it doesn't require animal slaughter. Um, and in terms of how would you go about to actually making cultivated meat, um, I, I like to structure it in four main categories of considerations. Um, so cell lines, um, which are basically the raw materials where you start, um, 
cell culture media, which is basically the broth that you provide to your cells with the necessary nutrients um, to be able to either grow them um, or uh, differentiate them towards the cell types that are found in meat, like muscle and fat in particular. Um, then there's the bioreactors and the bioprocessing, and this is where you can think about the bioreactor designs or developing these manufacturing processes for the cell types that you are targeting. And then there's the scaffolds or the biomaterials, and in this category you can have scaffolds to make what we like to uh, refer to as uh, structured cultured meat products, so think steak. Um, or even those microcarriers that um, I've mentioned earlier would still fall within this category um, as they would still be based on some sort of biomaterials. And as you guessed, most of my expertise has been in the bioreactors and bioprocessing category, but actually now since the UCL, I've started expanding into some of the other categories as well. Um, as Saren um, very nicely um, stated it, there are loads of opportunities across all of these areas um, um, and actually a lot of the type of research that has been done in the healthcare space is very much translatable to this um, space as well, but obviously with the considerations and the challenges of this new application. So I'm going to go a little bit through each of these um, uh, categories or some where um, I've identified um, uh, opportunities for biochemists. Um, the first category is the cells. Um, so generally, these would have to be able to differentiate into the components of meat. And actually, when I talk about cultured meat or cultivated meat, um, I also include fish in this category. Um, and that's even more exciting and I think even more opportunities uh, and gaps in knowledge um, for fish. Um, so in this category, in terms of limitations, um, obviously the cells that um, the industry and um, uh, even in the published research or available research, um, the cells that have been currently being used um, have been derived directly from tissue, which means that there are primary cells, but these come with certain limitations, like um, they have limitations in um, their growth potential, in um, some limitations in the differentiation ability, um, and then there's a lot of gaps in knowledge, um, particularly in the differentiation of these cell types. Um, so in terms of opportunities, obviously there's quite a lot, um, both in terms of the cell line development. So ideally to bypass those limitations of growth, you would want a cell type that is able to replicate indefinitely. So this is where um, biochemists could potentially contribute by looking at methods to immortalize these cells. Um, there's also loads of gaps in um, understanding the metabolism of these cells and there are opportunities of manipulating the metabolism um, to, for example, enhance the differentiation efficiency or enhance the cell yield. Um, and these, um, I mean, they're not only specific to cells because they do overlap somewhat with the media development, which is the other category um, of uh, uh, considerations as well. Um, so talking about media in a bit more detail, um, the formulations that are currently used have been very much inspired from um, the uh, research that has been done in healthcare, um, but obviously that approach comes with a price tag to it, which is not suitable for um, cultured meat production, because at the end of the day, this is the food. So um, I think at the end of the day, to make it successful and available and affordable um, to the large public, it would, the approaches to be taken Taken would need to be inspired from food science as well, uh, or from foods uh, and nutrition. Um, so those can be opportunities for research um, in, in that space. And generally the media is made out of a basal medium that contains um, uh, things like the source of carbon, the source of nitrogen, vitamins, amino acids, etc. And this is supplemented with um, serum. Um, and serum has been um, used for a very long time, particularly in, in healthcare applications, 
Um, and um, it has been shown to be very good at supporting cell growth, but there are a lot of disadvantages to using um, serum um, and a lot of limitations to it and challenges. So um, the industry is moving towards uh, replacing the serum, and I think that's where a lot of opportunities are. Um, and um, some of these approaches for replacing it include using growth factors, um, more unusual opportunities inspired from food science, like trying to use food grade uh, powders or components, um, hydrolysis to try to replace certain proteins, or using um, or even using algae and extra extracts from algae, which can be quite nutritious uh, to try to replace some of these components. Um, but obviously they all come with different price tags, um, some cheaper than others, but for example, the algae, even if it has a lot of potential, there's still a lot of gaps in knowledge there, and there's still a lot of research to be done in order to optimize the use of, of those algae extracts um, or food grades. Um, in terms of opportunities in the media as well, particularly in the growth factors area, um, there is a need for cheaper growth factors, um, but cheaper growth factors can be achieved through different means. And one such mean could be, for example, using metabolic engineering to produce better producing strains. And this is this leads to that precision fermentation that Saren was um, talking about earlier. And then just to kind of end on this, um, I've tried to put here a few areas where I think bio, um, uh, biochemists could um, have um, significant opportunities. Um, and you can see some of the typical ones, but then I think um, there's also, um, and Saren mentioned this as well, but there's also opportunities in the safety assessment, toxicology, um, those sorts of areas for the components and everything that goes into the production of cultured meat, um, biomaterials, strain development, um, and even on the other um, end of the production, the taste, the nutrition, the formulation of these products, um, I think those can also be opportunities for biochemists. Um, so thank you very much for your attention. I hope I haven't gone too much over time. Um, I am happy to take any questions now and over um, back over to you, Dave. Cool. Thank you so much, Petra. Really, really nice overview of your career, but also the opportunities, uh, I think, for people to get engaged in research in, in the cultivated meat space. Um, so we, we can now take questions uh, for either of the speakers or for both, if you wish. And um, if people do have questions that they would like to ask, please put it in the question box, um, as we can see on the screen here. And I'll get to as many of them as I can in the time that we have left. Um, I'm going to start out with quite a general question. And I guess both of you have given a really nice overview of the opportunities that are here, the challenges that exist and why biochemistry can help solve those. But I guess maybe traditionally people would have seen biochemistry perhaps as a, a discipline more to go into perhaps the medical space or things like that as opposed to food. And so why, what is it about biochemistry that makes it so applicable to the transition towards a sustainable food system through alternative proteins? And that's maybe to both of you, you can answer it depending on your particular points of view. Maybe Petra first, if you want to. Um, yeah, I, I think biochemistry is, is quite versatile. Um, and in the sense that, you know, biochemistry is, is about enzymes, it's about proteins, it's about uh, nucleic acids, RNA. I mean, there are a lot of um, new technologies coming around now with mRNAs, et cetera, that could potentially be used in these food systems. Uh, maybe, you know, as an example, that cell immortalization, for example, could be done with mRNAs. Um, to improve, uh, you know, to bypass those limitations of cell growth of primary cells. Um, but, I mean, that's just an example. I think it's, it's the versatility of biochemistry. I mean, I'm a biochemical engineer, but obviously even that, um, I, I, have, I still have the biochemistry background, but then obviously on top sure. of that, the engineering, which is where my bioprocessing skills come from. Um, but even in bioprocessing, I mean, I've used biochemistry quite a lot because I, um, 
I don't like to rely on just one way of measuring things in, um, especially in bioreactor cultures. I always like to combine different ways. And actually biochemistry has allowed me to look at things like cell metabolism um, and try to understand better what happens inside the bioreactor and how the cells will perform um, in different conditions. So yeah, so I think for me is that versatility that um, yeah. you don't really get with a lot of disciplines focus on the really fundamental building blocks of, of life and how to apply them yeah. to food. Yeah. And Saren, for you? Yeah. Um, so what I, I'll, I'll answer the question rather than talking about why biochemistry can be so well applied to alternative proteins. I think Petra's done a fantastic job of overviewing that for cultivated meat and more generally for the sector. Um, I think the, the additional point I can make is that for for those who have a background in biochemistry, it often seems like the default path is to move into medicine, biotech, pharmaceuticals, um, either in academia or in industry. And kind of back to that point about white space that I, I kind of kept kind of referring to during my talk, I think in science, it can be really exciting to work on problems which others haven't kind of hit diminishing returns on. And alternative proteins, we're so early on in that kind of knowledge curve, so to speak. Like it's such a new area of science. New people can move into this space and have done already master's students um, doing work which can then go on to lead to the founding of companies. Um, that's a really, really unique opportunity if you want to have a huge amount of impact for what in another field um, might be quite hard to do with just one person's work laying kind of one more brick on the wall, so to speak. So that would be my pitch. Um, it's the opportunity to have a lot of impact for um, uh, relatively little resources, so to speak. It's just, a, it's just a very kind of blank page. Yeah, okay. Um, okay, we have a question here. Do you think research in cultivated meat can be driven by academia? I'm asking because I feel like at the time at the moment, academia is a bit behind on industry. Um, I guess that is to either of you. It doesn't say to who it's for, but it is a yeah. good question. I think this area is led largely by industry. Yeah, so I mean, that. I can I can give you my perspective from both <laughs> academia and industry. Um, I think in some respects, yes, academia is behind industry. Um, I think one, one reason um, for that has obviously been funding. Um, and um, but I do have to say that because I've been working in this space since 2019 and in the UK and I've seen a significant increase in funding um, in the space. I mean, I have three projects literally starting now in October and November and they're all in cultivated meat space. Um, and I'm actually seeing a lot of um, a, a, a very high increase in the students that approached me as well to say that they would like to do a PhD in the space, which, you know, three years ago, four years ago, I was struggling to recruit. So, yeah, so I think from that point of view, I think academia is catching up because the funding now is more readily available. Um, in industry, things move a lot quicker. There's a lot more money because of venture um, funding as well. Um, but in industry, usually you have larger teams, which means that you can get, you know, more hands, you can get a lot more work done. In academia, usually you're relying on PhD students that are learning. So for the first two years of their PhD, they're learning techniques um, and the chance of them getting uh, enough data to get publications out, you know, is not as high at that point because they're still learning. Um, if you get postdocs in that haven't worked in the space and they're not quite familiar, again, there's a there's a transition period where they need to, um, you know, get familiar with the techniques, etc. Um, but actually, as I said, with you know, with the increase in funding, I think we will see a lot more coming out um, from academia in the next couple of years for sure. And GFI has obviously done an absolutely amazing job. Uh, with their funding and promoting publications, etc. So, yeah, so that has been very, very useful for sure. And I guess it's fair to say that industry is very important to commercialize these things, but we also need open access yeah. information to share across um, communities. So that we can I'm actually starting to see quite a lot more collaborations as well between industry and academia, mm -hmm. which I think is really encouraging. 
Um, and in a way, you know, maybe we, we haven't really seen that two years ago because, because of IP and in this industry, you know, IP is so important at this stage that, um, yeah, the, the, you know, they the just, academia and industry haven't really been on the same page <laughs> from that point of view. So, but I'm starting to see an increase in that as well. Okay, interesting. There's a question, um, it's kind of links uh, to a couple final, of things. Go ahead, Sarah. I'm just going to add a final data point on that. Um, so, kind of Petra said, we're seeing more collaboration between academia and industry, which is, is exactly right. And I think the cultivating meat sector in general is becoming more sophisticated. It's not just a small number of startups, but lots of kind of companies moving into focus on specific parts of the supply chain and kind of B2B um, activities. The other thing we're seeing is that the companies themselves are starting to publish and that's a really nice um, development that that I say is kind of in the last 18 to 24 months or so we're seeing more of um, yeah. yeah more indicators that things are shifting more towards um, I guess the normal balance between open versus private R&D and with that sure. I'll let you ask your next question Dave. <laughs> yeah no that's cool and as those companies start to mature as well and they start to have that IP that they're happy to share, I think that's a really important part of developing their ecosystems. And um, there is a question about, I guess, and this is kind of linked to a couple of things maybe you've said, so I'm going to ask it as two different questions to both of you, but um, for someone with a background in biochemistry um, who maybe wants to get involved in alternative proteins but doesn't really know how, and I think that's interesting based, Sarah, on what you've said about there's so much white space that maybe it's kind of hard to know where to start almost, you know, you, you don't even know how you would transfer. Um, you know what would be your kind of specific your your advice to them um maybe in general uh, in terms of transitioning into the industry and maybe Sarah, you can take that and then also petra in terms of if you're a researcher academic researcher wants to start work on this space what are the steps that you should take maybe are the things you should think about when when trying to move into it so maybe Sarah, if you want to address it first as a for people working generally say in the food industry or whatever it might be that want to transfer into this what would be your advice yeah, so um, food is obviously so cross-cutting that there's a huge number of roles and backgrounds, whether it's on the food science product development um, side all the way through to the, the marketing kind of more business awareness type roles. Um, I think it really depends on what your skills and your interests lie. Um, we do have a bunch of different resources within the kind of GFI um ecosystem from um kind of joining into webinars and things or you can join our gfi ideas community and start reaching out and just having conversations with people working in the sector and starting to build those relationships um we host a careers database where you can essentially just look at open job roles in the sector and see if any of them are things that happen to suit what you're interested in um and whether you'd be interested in applying and then for scientists specifically, we again have a bunch of different things like a funding database, um, the researcher directory, you can find collaborators, a literature library where you can just see a curated list of some of the most relevant research papers. Um, yeah, I guess the short version is my answer is um, we probably have something helpful on our website somewhere and it's, it's worth taking a look because we really want to kind of lower that barrier to entry as much as possible to make it as easy as possible for people to to move into the space, but I'll I'll hand it over to Petra in case she has more things to say about scientifically. Um, yeah, so I, I think from my perspective, um, what I would say is, um, I mean, there's there's a lot of resources out there. Uh, if you do want to launch yourself into into the alternative protein space, maybe it's worth um, dedicating a little bit of time to learn the general aspects. And I think GFI has a lot of resources, as Saren said, um, that can get you up to speed so that you can identify the area within this, because it's quite wide. I mean, there's so many opportunities, but um, if you can identify the area that you might have an interest or you might want to work in. Um, and now I think there's there are a lot of opportunities from universities um, to do PhD projects. I mean, I'm advertising a few, um, <laughs> uh, so obviously I'm a bit biased there, but um, I'm advertising a few through UCL. Um, I know there are um, several other opportunities at other universities within the UK if you want to go down the PhD route. Um, otherwise, I think there's, there's going to be, as I said, with the increase in funding, there's going to be more opportunities for postdoctoral researchers as well. Um, um, so yeah, so I think I think in terms of 
getting into this area if you have the skills that would suit particular applications or particular open positions, I mean, go for it. I don't think anyone is really expecting to hire people that have already worked in the cultivated meat space or anything like that. I mean, I, I know, and we, we have this approach both here at UCL, but also the company, we look for the people with the right skills. We don't really care you know, what background they're coming from. And actually, if you're coming from a food science background, I would very happily take you because I feel like I don't have that experience. So it would be a very new, very fresh um, set of eyes, very fresh approach to what we're doing. And I think that's what we need. I mean, I've, you know, I've mentioned this many times, but I think um, to make these sorts of products affordable and available and get there where we want to, we're going to need to take inspiration from some of the other areas and particularly from food science, food engineering. I mean, there's so many techniques that are very well established and there's so much knowledge, but because everything is kind of, everything that we do um, at the moment in this area comes from healthcare, you know, you're not really familiar with those other um, technologies and tools. So, yeah, so definitely go for it. Cool. Uh, I think we've got time for one very brief question. We've got one here um, about education. Are there any plans for universities to start teaching about things like cultivated meat at either master's or undergraduate level? Yeah, um, I mean, I, I can start on that. Um, so I am trying uh, UCL. Um, I'm trying to put forward um, a minor that would be taken um, by our existing engineering students um, in food processing that would have a lot of elements in the uh, from the alternative proteins. Um, and I'm also trying now to um, put forward um, my plans for an MSc in the space. Um, unfortunately, it takes quite a long time to implement <laughs> so, um, you know, new programs and uh, changes to, to the curriculum in universities. So I think realistically, it would probably be available in, in the next three years, maybe four years. Um, yeah, um, I, I think there are other universities that have um, you know, plans for an earlier, yeah, uh, release of these type of product of uh, programs, but um, yeah. Cool. Yeah. Okay. And I guess in time we will probably see these things just start to fall into traditional food science type education, etc., as it becomes much more ma mainstream as as time goes on. Okay. Um, we are coming up to the top of the hour, so I will have to wrap things up, unfortunately. Um, I guess a couple of things just to say before we do finish. The first is just to thank everybody for attending and especially to Sarah and Petra for, for their really, really interesting uh, presentations and also the discussion around careers in alternative proteins in this space. You can continue the conversation online. You can follow at BiochemSoc, at PP Publishing and at Good Food Institute on Twitter or X, depending on how you like to call it. Um, the Biochem Biochemical Society welcomes suggestions for future topics uh, and speakers to feature in this Biochemistry Focus webinar series. If you have an idea for a webinar in 2023 or 2024, we invite you to submit a proposal for an upcoming webinar and you can find more information about webinars, propose your webinar and also watch previous recordings at biochemistry.org. Um, all upcoming webinars are also listed on the website uh, and if you've missed any of the 70 plus webinars that have already been run as part of this series you can watch them again um, on the website or the YouTube channel. Um, the recording from today's webinar will also be available uh, to watch within the next couple of weeks. You can join the Biochemical Society again on the 8th of November at 11 a.m. British time uh, for the next webinar on developments in protein function and cell behavior uh, where three Early career researchers will discuss the latest success in combining innovative models and techniques to tackle complex biological problems. Um, another thing to say is the Biochemical Society 2025 awards are now available for nominations, uh, featuring new categories and a streamlined nomination process. There's never been a better time to nominate an outstanding peer or colleague who deserves recognition. The deadline for initial nominations is the 1st of November 2023, with submissions welcomed by and for both members and non-members. And you can visit the website to find out more about that. Um, and then finally, I'd like to highlight that 
It is more important than ever to stay connected, engaged with your uh, fellow molecular uh, bioscientists so you can join the Biochemical Society's community of researchers and specialists to take advantage of key benefits, including discounted registration fees for society courses and meetings, exclusive access to a wide range of grants and bursaries, personal online access to two of their journals, and much, much more. So you can visit the website to find out more about that. So that's all, folks. Uh, thank you to everyone who who uh, tuned in. Thank you so much to Saren and Petra again, and enjoy the rest of your day. Bye-bye.